Hello, let's continue our reading. This is the Penderwicks in Spring, chapter five, entitled Abandoned. A long row of hydrangea bushes ran along one side of Penderwick home. Now in the spring, they were mere clumps of sticks, drab and bare, with an occasional withered blossom from last year that had hung on through the winter storms. To Ben, the drabness made as little impression as would the delirious beauty that always arrived midsummer when the bushes drooped with masses of multi-flowered pom-poms, large as grapefruits, in shades of pinks, blues, and purples. Here they describe beauty as being delirious in the sentence, which also means very enthusiastic beauty. No, what he cared about was the space between the bushes and the house, a narrow corridor of privacy he'd claimed as his own the previous summer. There, he'd stored the rocks, not exciting enough to be taken inside, and he and Raphael had constructed things from them, roads, bridges, and building-like structures that could double as military installations and alien invasion forces. After breakfast on Saturday morning, Ben shoved through the hydrangeas, set down a large cardboard box, then brushed away the dead leaves and sticks that had accumulated since the previous fall. The winter hadn't done damage to his work. Good. Sometimes he thought he'd like to build real roads and bridges when he grew up. And maybe he could convince Raphael to be an architect, like after they'd made several movies and wanted to move on to new careers. Together, they could build whole new cities. Ben crouched down and opened the cardboard box. First out, one of his most prized possessions, a model UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter with real doors and seats. This had been a gift from Nick, oldest son of the Geiger family across the street, handed over before he'd gone overseas to fly around in helicopters, just like this one, helping to fight a war. Lieutenant Nick Geiger of the United States Army, that's who he was now. Ben's mom had shown him on a map where Nick was fighting a place of mountains, desert, and lots of small villages, all very far away. Nick and his younger brother Tommy had grown up mixed together with the Penderwicks, sometimes babysitting for them, and always making good jokes, plus teaching sports to everyone from Rosalind on to down, though not as far as Lydia, and also failing with Batty, hopeless as she was at sports. Nick had taught Ben football and had promised to start on basketball the next time he came home on leave. He was due home sometime this spring. It couldn't be soon enough for Ben, who missed him terribly. With the Black Hawk safely out, he dumped the rest of the box onto the ground. Here was a hodgepodge of action toys, many of them inherited from Nick and Tommy, plus a battered Millennium Falcon from his, Ben's mom. There were several from Ben's father, too, his birth father, that is, not his dad. These were all Star Trek figures, especially from the next generation. Worf, Troy, Picard, and a few evil-looking Romulans. All that Ben knew about this father, who had died in a car crash before Ben was even born, came from stories his mom told him. Sometimes he and Batty talked about their dead parents, but not often, and usually not with sadness. It's hard to be sad about people you've never met, especially when the parents you ended up with are so good at being parents. Ben's box had also yielded up a Chinook with only one set of rotor blades, a transporter room with a big crack down the middle, and lots more figures. Other than the next generation ones, Ben could identify only about half, including Luke Skywalker, Chewbacca, Spock, and Ginny Wesley, Weasley, whose red hair was almost the same shade as his. The rest of the figures he used for his own purposes. An authoritative, 
in other words, a commanding man in a blue uniform was Nick. And there was one mean looking guy, all in black, that Ben called Dexter Dupree after a famous, a man famous among the Penderwicks for his loathsome personality. Dexter had once been married to Jeffrey's mother, but they divorced several years ago, after which she'd managed to marry and divorce another man. I was rumored to be engaged yet again. Ben set Dexter on a rock and spoke to him in his deepest voice, using the military code he'd learned from Nick. Ready for defeat, Delta, Echo, X-ray, Tango, Echo, Romeo? Never, never, squeaked Dexter, who wasn't smart enough for code. Ha, 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 you're doomed. Ben balanced Nick on the Black Hawk. He was too big to fit inside, just out of reach of the rotor blades. This is your leader, November, India, Charlie, Kilo. Prepare for departure. Start engines. Shwoof, 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 shwoof. There you are. His position had been discovered by a person or persons unknown. Ben tipped Nick into the underbrush for safety, then parked the Black Hawk behind the Millennium Falcon. You're entering a war zone, he said in a deep voice. Prepare to defend yourself. Okay. The intruder turned out to be Sky, now shoving through the bushes. In the mood for some goalkeeping? Sky was always trying to put him into an old catcher's mask and chest protector, more hand-me-downs from the Geiger brothers, so she could shoot soccer balls at him. This was not Ben's idea of fun. No, he answered. What's Captain Apollo doing? She pointed down at the man in the blue uniform, half hidden up by dried up hydrangea bloom. That's Nick. Nick is a colonial warrior? I guess that works. He's coming home soon, right, Sky? We hope so, buddy. The Geigers will let us know as soon as they hear anything. She kicked aside more dead leaves. Okay, if I sit down? He scooted over to make room, and down she came, squashing Dexter with her knee. Sorry, Spike, she said. That's Dexter, said Ben. Actually, this is Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He's a bad guy. So Dexter works, I guess. Good. Ben had gotten the bad part right. She picked out a female Romulan. This can be Jeffrey's mom, Mrs. T.D.M. I thought she was Mrs. Tifton now. After Jeffrey's mother had divorced the husband after Dexter, Mr. Menduzio, the Penderwicks had decided it was simpler to stick with calling her Mrs. Tifton, no matter how many more times she got married and divorced. You're right, hard woman. Okay, so the Romulan is Mrs. Tifton, and you've got Dexter, so this Dalek can be Menduzio. She smashed the Dalek into the Romulan. Exterminate! Exterminate! Mercy, mercy, shrieked Ben, tossing Dexter into the fray. No mercy for you, horrible parent and step-parents, said Skye. Blam, blast, boom, blom. I'm melting, melting. Skye put down her now quite defeated figures. So Ben, she said, you're a boy. Yes, he answered warily. Didn't seem like a good way for the conversation to go. And you have friends who are girls, right? Like Remy? That was a hundred years ago. Well, if she were still your friend, would you make the mistake of wanting to move past friendship and into romance? Ben was confused. Sky usually made more sense than this. Are you wanting to be romantic about Nick? He asked tentatively. Nick? Good grief now. Then what are you talking about? Let me put it another way, said Sky. Jeffrey's getting all weird and talking about wanting me to be his girlfriend. Oh, that is weird. So I told him not to come this weekend. Not come here? Ben couldn't believe that he was hearing. Jeffrey was an honorary Penderwick, always welcome at their house. Plus, there was that Celtics t-shirt he promised to bring Ben. Only for this weekend, so that he has time to get sensible again. I said he could visit for my birthday. It's only two weeks from now. Not too long, right? I guess not. He turned the rotors on his Black Hawk. So you're not going to make him disappear like Rosalind did with Tommy? Rosalind didn't. Yes, she did, Sky. Tommy Geiger had been Rosalind's boyfriend for years and years, and then suddenly wasn't anymore when they went to college. 
Batty had tried to explain it to Ben. Something about new beginnings and exploring options. But none of it had made sense to him. Tommy didn't even come over to see us when he was home at Christmas, and I wanted to show him my presents. I always show him my presents. Okay, she sort of did, but it wasn't all her fault. They decided together that they needed a break. Anyway, I figured they'll get back together one of these days, and I'm not breaking up with Jeffrey. I'm wisely keeping us from getting together in the first place. It's completely different from Rosalind and Tommy. Skye picked up Dalek and squeezed it mercilessly. I just don't want a boyfriend right now. I want to get out of high school and go to college and learn, learn, learn and soak up the universe. I wish you understood. Well, I don't want a girlfriend, but not just now, never. Which meant he did understand that part, but not about soaking up the universe. Thank you, that's a help anyway. If you won't do soccer with me, I'm going to take a long bike ride to think. Will you tell everyone about Jeffrey not coming? I can't tell Jane because she's still asleep. And I can't tell Dad or Iantha because they'll get all concerned and make me feel awful. But I'm busy, protested Ben. It was times like this when he most wished he had brothers. Or if he couldn't have actual brothers, that Nick, Tommy, and Jeffrey would stay where they would could do the most good on Gardam Street with Ben. Please? Oh, all right. It was hard for him to refuse Sky when she lowered her dignity enough to say please. But you have to tell Batty. Why can't you tell her too? Because she's looking forward to him coming the most, which meant she might cry, and Ben didn't think he should have to deal with crying when this was clearly Sky's problem. But after Sky said please three more times, he gave in. Ben found both his parents in the kitchen drinking coffee. Lydia was there too, sitting on the floor, making mysterious patterns with spoons. Ben and Raphael sometimes wondered if she picked up signals from aliens trying to connect with earthlings. If so, the aliens had picked the wrong human, that's for sure. Lydia loves Ben, she said, looking up from her spoons. I know that, he turned to his parents. Skye said to tell you Jeffrey isn't coming this weekend. Why not, his mom asked, is he all right? He wants to be Skye's boyfriend. Ben wasn't sure if that fell into the category of being all right. And she doesn't want a boyfriend because of soaking up the universe. But she said Jeffrey could come for her birthday. Ben's parents were exchanging the kind of looks that meant they'd be discussing this after Ben left the room. That was fine with him. He was already weary of talking about it. And there was still Batty to tell. Is Batty upstairs, he asked, because I need to see her. Yes, she is. But wait a minute, said his dad. We're shopping for a car today. Want to come along? Is Lydia going? She is because we're also going to look for a big girl bed, which Lydia is very excited about, isn't she? None. Lydia had no interest in a big girl bed. Iantha said to Ben, tell your sister how much fun it is to sleep in a real bed. Ben was unsure he wanted Lydia to get a new bed. Her attempts to get out of the crib were becoming ever more determined. What would life be when she could simply roll out of bed and go wherever she liked? She'll really be able to escape now. Yes, without the danger of falling on her head when she climbs out of the crib. Oh, yeah, he said, trying to sound enthusiastic. A real bed is fun. Lydia gave him a suspicious look, then moved one of her spoons a quarter inch further left. I think I'll stay home, said Ben, and trudged upstairs. Batty was in her room, listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, a piece of music thrilling enough to keep her from going crazy waiting for Jeffrey. It was, only, it was the only Beethoven symphony she owned and was marred by a scratch in the beginning of the fourth movement. Someday, when she had lots of money, she was going to buy all of Beethoven's symphonies with no scratches on any of them. The Beethoven served another purpose. It was loud enough to drown out any singing that might suddenly pop out of Batty. Her family was used to her humming. Anybody could hum. But this was different, more like she'd become inhabited by a sprite, fond of bursting into song at any old time. It had started the evening before, but while Batty had managed to keep it quiet when anyone else was around, she definitely needed to learn more control. Here came the fourth movement, Scratch. Ein, 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 ein. 
Batty rushed to turn off the rec record player. In the sudden silence, she heard Ben's private signal. Come in, she said. He did, looking grumpy. That music was so loud you couldn't hear me knock. Sorry, she said. And then it happened. Her sprite tried to sing. Batty clapped her hand over her mouth and hoped Ben hadn't noticed. He'd noticed. What was that sound? What sound? Is what Batty said, except that it sounded like because her hand was still over her mouth. That sound you just made. Maybe your stomach was growling. He stared at her suspiciously. His stomach hadn't growled. There it goes again. Maybe it's my stomach. She started to push him toward the door, but he resisted. If it's your stomach, why is your hand over your mouth? She took away her hand, but kept her teeth clenched just in case and tried again to get him out of the room. Stop pushing me. I have a message to give you from Sky. Batty's sprite disappeared and Batty stopped shoving her brother. What message? I'll tell you, but you can't cry. Just tell me. Jeffrey's not coming this weekend. She sat down on her bed with a thump. Why? Skye said he couldn't because he wants to be her boyfriend and she doesn't want to be his girlfriend. Batty was horrified. They'd already been through all of this. A few years earlier, Jeffrey had decided that Skye should be his girlfriend and she told him he was an idiot. Then he fell for a girl named Margot at his school in Boston who turned out to actually be an idiot obsessed with clothes and money, which Jeffrey finally realized, then came to his senses and swore he was done with romance and would now turn his life completely over to music. He'd even asked Mr. Penderwick for a Latin motto that would express just that. Musica anima mea est, which means music is my life. So why was his, he starting up with love again? Was he turning into a boringly normal teenager? This is disaster, she said. Don't cry. Stop telling me not to cry. I'm not anyway. Just a tiny little bit because of the shock. But Skye said Jeffrey could come for her birthday, so he won't disappear forever like Tommy did, said Ben. Okay, that's all. So I'll go now. And don't push me out. Wiping her eyes, Betty realized that she shouldn't have pushed him, singing Sprite or no singing Sprite. She didn't like it when her older sisters tried to get rid of her. I'm sorry I did that, she said. Ben had already left the room, head held high. At one end of Garden Street, halfway round a cul-de-sac, was the path into a 40-acre slice of paradise called Quigley Woods, a wild realm of trees, rocks, and water, and a favorite refuge for all the Penderwicks, refuge being a place to go that's safe. Batty hadn't yet gone there this spring, so not since Hound's death, but she went now, meaning to be alone and think. Winter had more of a hold here than on the lawns of Gardam Street. Patches of snow stubbornly lingered in the shadows, far too many for Batty to stomp away. She broke into a run to warm herself up, racing under the still barren trees. After a dip in the path, just before a low crumbling stone wall, she turned off onto a path that led down to her favorite spot in the woods, chosen long again with hound. She had picked it for the ancient willow tree, both huge and graceful, and hound for the creek that ran under the willow's vast canopy, where he could splash in the shallows while still keeping a watchful eye on Batty. But when she reached the willow, she found it already occupied by a male cardinal, furious with this human glumphing into his home. Please stay, she said. I've come to visit, that's all. But the bird flew off a red and unforgiving blur. Abandoned, Batty looked up through the bare willow branches to the soft blue sky. Maybe she shouldn't have come here yet, not until she'd stopped missing hounds so terribly. She sat down and leaned against the willow, glad for its familiar support, and tossed a stick into the creek. Her dad had once told her that hound wouldn't want Batty to mourn for long, that he'd loved her too much to want her miserable. She asked her dad how he could be certain, and he said that years ago, someone had told him that very thing before she died. My mother, you mean, Batty said, and he answered yes. 
it hadn't helped. She wondered what Hound would have made of this singing business. He hadn't been a particularly musical dog, showing no preference for Mozart or Motown, Beyonce or Beethoven. If he'd ever even noticed the difference, Jeffrey had called him the perfect audience since he would wag his tail for anything that he played on the piano, even deliberate discord, which means harsh sounds. She tried to picture him there in front of her, already wet from his first dip in the creek, his tongue hanging out with excitement, his brown eyes warm with love. I wish I hadn't let you die. She said it to the creek and the trees and the sky and the bird that had flown away. So there came no answer. Never an answer. She had so been looking forward to seeing Jeffrey, to singing for him. Oh, now she was about to cry again. Except, except that Hound had never wasted time feeling sorry for himself, and Batty shouldn't either. She watched the creek, the sun glancing off the water, and listened to its gentle plashing. Maybe this wasn't a disaster with Skye and Jeffrey. If Skye had said he could come in two weeks for her birthday, she must be counting on the boyfriend-girlfriend stuff to blow over pretty quickly. And since Skye's birthday was eight days before Batty's, there would still be time for Jeffrey to help plan the grand 11th birthday concert. I just have to wait a little longer, she said. I can do that. And while she waited, she could start learning about this voice Mrs. Grunfeld had discovered. After all, musica anima mea est was Batty's motto too. She stood up, planting her feet firmly on the ground, sheltered under her willow tree. What was it that Mrs. Grunfeld had said? Open yourself to the music. All right, two deep breaths. Batty started to sing. And that is the end of chapter five.